But it is Dream Sunday, and Pastor Sam this morning uh, shared a message kind of just unpacking the heart of really what we need to be doing in this next season as a church, buying into, and I encourage you to jump on YouTube. I won't try and uh, recap that too much because I won't do it justice. So make sure you jump on YouTube while you're there. Make sure you subscribe. Give us a like and a subscribe. Uh, Helps, goes a long way, and uh, be a part of that. But Pastor Sam did make uh, did, did share with us this morning three declarations that we want to be making as a church, as, as, as not as a church just corporately, but as, as me as a part of this church, me as part of a corporate church. Church is in a place I come. It's the, it's the community I'm a part of. It's the family I'm a part of. And uh, when I first came into this church, corporate to me was a building. Uh, it was a place I came to, but it quickly became family, uh, became my community. It's where I met my wife. And... Uh, it's going to be the church. We bring our son up in, and uh, I'm going to be training him early to beat up all the other kids in kids' church, and so I've already got a regime planned out for that, and not all kids, just mainly Nathaniel's kid, and um, but we're working on that, but there's three declarations to make, and the first is, is I have ownership. I have ownership. Come on, equipers is an our thing. It's not our idea. Come on, it's something I'm a part of. It's not boots on a few. It's built on the many just saying, you know what? I am equipers. I am an equipers. I am an equipper. The second thing is I carry kingdom culture. The culture isn't just for the way we serve here on a Sunday or attend here on a Sunday, and then we go home and, and carry on like nothing's going on. But our lives should have a consistency to it. The, our values of our lives should have a, have a consistency. Wherever I am, the kingdom culture is with me, and I influence environments rather than allowing environments to influence me. And uh, so I carry kingdom culture, and the last is I am leaving a God legacy. Everyone's leaving some sort of legacy. I pray the legacy left from my life doesn't just point to me. I pray it points people to Jesus, points people to God. And so I'm, I'm leaving a legacy. And I encourage you to get on and uh, have a look at that. And while I was sitting there listening this morning, it got me reflecting about my journey here at Equippers. Um, uh, it was about 12 years ago I first walked into an Equippers church. Uh, it was actually this building, my first experience of Equippers. Well, I went to a camp. Uh, in this room, you know, a few, a few of the older ones might know of this camp, but there was a camp called Branded, and uh, it was it was it was like some revolution, but like pre pre understanding how to do camps as awesome as we do them now. No, but Brandon <laughs> Brandon Brandon was a good time. I'd never been to a church, uh, anything to do with Coopers. I hadn't even heard of Coopers. I don't even know who these people were. I turned up to a church. I hadn't been in church for about six months, and I was about eighteen years old, or a little bit older at that stage. Actually, I was. I was and I walked into a, a church, and um, the, I was the first Sunday there. My friend was a part of that church, and they were going to a camp, and they needed another driver. And they said, hey, would you help us drive some kids to this camp? I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, good Samaritan out here loving on people. And so I drove, drove to this camp in Mata Mata. And, uh, and that, that camp was actually hosted by Equippers. And I remember being there that whole weekend. I grew up in my whole life uh, in church, around church people, but I never met people quite this crazy. Like I had met crazy Christians, but like a different kind of crazy. But I, I, these are like, man, these guys are another level in terms of their passion, their energy. And at that camp is where I met people like Pastor Jordan and different ones like that, Kyle Brockman, I met Benji there, a whole group like that. And I was like, mate, any church that can handle these guys is probably a good church for me. And so I, uh, they said they got a live worship recording uh, that Sunday night. And so I drove my car up from Thames or Thames, depending on how you pronounce it. And uh, I, I arrived here and came to a live worship recording. I stood in the back of the balcony there, and this environment had such an impact in the redirection of my life. And uh, since then, uh, I was part of an Acts church that then became an Equippers church. And so it was about 10 years ago that I actually officially became part of the Equippers family. And uh, I was a friend of Equippers for a little while, and then they had to take me whether they liked me or not. And uh, that's, that's like the most of us around here. And uh, you don't choose your family. But anyway, this is the, the best one I know 
know of. But I walked in about 10 years ago, and then this morning I was just reflecting the last 10 years, kind of what I've seen since I've been part of Equipus Church. And uh, it's been incredible to see the development, actually, of what God's done in this place. You know, in the last 10 years, I've seen things. We've, in the last 10 years of my involvement, just showing up to events, serving where I can, we've seen thousands of lives impacted. In fact, I, I, ref, I found an old Google doc uh, a little while ago, and it was stats from Revolution to a to 10 years ago. It's the first Revolution to I ever went on, and uh, it was stats. And, in the, and across 10 days, uh, we saw just over 4,000 people give their life to Jesus. And uh, through night shows across 10 days, over 13,000 people in attendance across those 10 days. And uh, since I've been part, I've seen the, the launch of a Cooper's Revolution and uh, music that has has touched the globe. And, uh, and, and not just a little old youth man here in Auckland, but has actually done uh, some significant things. I've seen arenas full. I remember the first shout at Spark Arena and uh, just amazed that actually the church could occupy a venue like this and a place like this. Oh, and then oh, the launch of Open Heaven and seeing that take place. Uh, I've been able to see Youth Hub started. And uh, I think initially we just had a, a center and a west and a north when I first showed up and been able to see new hubs planted. In fact, I heard on Friday night, West had 92 out, 92 young people, <laughs> over 20 giving their life to Jesus. And uh, from then we've seen new locations planted. I don't know how many locations or what countries we're in, but we're in them. And uh, churches are starting. And uh, I used to try and count and keep up and I gave up. And so I just go with it and clap along. That's awesome. But we've been out even start recently this year, two more uh, service locations here in Auckland. We've got one on the west side and one on the east side. And um, it's been crazy since then. I've also seen college grow. I think in the second half of my year, there was 26 of us uh, that made it through the first half. <laughs> and uh, we don't talk about the, first, the, the rest that were in there. But 26 of us made it through to the second half and seen college grow and develop since then. And uh, actually, I've seen initiatives like Encounter Start. I've been able to witness by the gate launch and get traction uh, that's gone on now for about six or seven years and seeing count so many young people by this school gate praying. And I love by the gate because I was, I was being around a little bit long enough to know pre by the gate when, when youth leaders, youth pastors used to complain about, about kids not being able to pray. Uh, youth not wanting to pray. And we used to host youth meetings and youth prayer meetings and no one would show up and all the youth leaders would sit around and complain. I love how it's kind of done the complete opposite. I love the fact that our young people are actually up earlier than our youth leaders praying uh, out by the gate, praying more, praying more passionately, praying more boldly. And uh, we've also seen some awesome failures in that whole journey too. And uh, that's been exciting. And uh, I remember, we don't talk about this publicly, so maybe we just pause the live recording, but well, there's one idea, oh, we blame it on Pastor Willem, that what's well, a good idea is to chuck lots of chocolate out of a helicopter across Auckland uh, on Easter. In fact, I was away, I was actually down, it was one of the first um, trips where I got to meet Leela's parents, and so I was nervous enough about that, and so uh, I was down there, and so I was in an Auckland, and I was sitting there watching the news. And then Willie, Pastor Willie pops up on the news. I was like, hey, Equipus Church is on the news. And then like listening to it for a minute, I was like, ooh, Equipus is on the news. <laughs> and uh, just, just, just Google big egg drop. Uh, no, don't, don't. But it didn't, it didn't quite go to plan. I've seen, I remember we had this awesome idea. Uh, we used to do big night rallies like the Uprising on the back of school programs. And we had this idea, let's not do one in Auckland, let's do four. And uh, let's just hire four arenas around Auckland and see thousands of people come out. It's going to be epic. And uh, we hired the Bruce Mason on the North Shore. And uh, it's 1,200 seats. And I was part of the prayer meetings. Come on, God, we're praying for a full building. We're praying for revival on the North Shore. We're praying. We have Reggie Dabs there and LZ7 and we, the guys had done all of this and, and we were there for revival and then we opened the doors it was like yeah I don't think anyone's coming hey? <laughs> and we had this 1200 seater actually I found the stats in that same document we had 220 people out that night but what the stats don't tell you is we also had 180 people on team and so we actually had 40 people out that night and uh, it was a, a big building and a fun night for the team to party away uh, that night and we've done a lot of stuff we've done a lot of stuff but one thing I've come to realize the more I've been around this place is it's less to do with the stuff 
and who the stuff is serving. It's less to do with what we're doing, but who we're trying to serve with what we're doing. It's not just about launching new locations. It's about reaching new lives. I love the fact this morning, even out west, there was like 13 new kids first time in kids' church. We didn't start West just to have another location on the website that we need to update. We started West Auckland so we could reach new lives, reach and impact more people. The more I've been around, the, less, the, the, the more I've realized it's less about what we're doing and more about who we're reaching, the lives we're impacting, the things we're doing. And as the dream keeps developing, it's, it's not so much about what we're going to go on to do. It's about how can we serve our city better? How can we reach more people? How can we let more people know of what it is that God's done in our lives? That's why we do stuff. Nobody got time to be out here just doing stuff for the fun of it. I mean, it makes for a good Instagram story every now and again, but uh, that's about it. I ain't got time to give up time for stuff, but I'll give up time for people. Things that are going to serve and impact people. Lives that are going to be changed. I was reflecting not just the stuff we've done. I was reflecting some of the lives I've seen changed since I've been around. I remember the night Cooper came along to, to, to one of our environments. And, um, and it was a great night for the movement. Changed us forever from that moment, the moment Cooper joined. But uh, I remember when Coop walked in. In fact, I hear the story of Coop's night. It was at one of the uprisings we do. And uh, he was there, and his friend uh, just at the altar call came down. Cooper didn't really know what was going on. The altar call came. Hey, if you want to give your life to Jesus, come down the front. And his friend turned to him, and he's like, bro, let's go down. He's like, well, what are we doing? He's like, don't worry, it's cool. <laughs> and so Cooper gave his life to Jesus that way. I'm not sure if the salvation is validated or not, but we'll find out. Um, I'm sure he's given his life back to Jesus since then. But uh, I've been on that journey to be able to see him grow, develop. I've had the, the, I was actually talking to a guy this morning, AJ, he's part of our international community. I remember being at AUT when we decided, when I first got involved in young adults, we are like, what do we do? And we're like, let's just run an f- event at AUT one night. And um, AU2, and um, I went to AUT as a student, and um, the bar's pretty low to get in, and so, hey, I was there, I was there, and we thought, you know what, let's start on that campus, because they just let us do whatever we want, and so we we went there, and um, and we just ran this night, this random night, again, it just, initially it was just stuff. Um, and then what happened that night is, is AJ <laughs> happened to be walking past and I uh, came into the service and gave his life and that was about six years ago and ever since then it was the first time he, he had encountered Jesus, knew Jesus and now he's still in church. We've been able to see him baptized and grow in his faith and, and serve and now he's helping lead an international hub which is doing exactly the same thing. He's helping other people on AUT come to know Jesus. I've been able to, I, I, I remember that, that Bruce Mason event I thought was a huge failure and, and ignored um, and didn't tell Pastor Sam about, but uh, that, that, that Bruce May, he was actually there, that was the hard thing about it all, but uh, that night is actually the night Erica came to know Jesus. Many of us know Erica, the, the guitar player. Erica, many people don't know, is actually the first girl to do, the first person to do By the Gate. She started the whole thing, and it was actually at Bruce Mason where she came a, lot, lot, a, night, a night that we had done all of this and saw hardly anyone turn out, but what we did see is somebody's life got radically changed, and that's why we do what we do. I've been around long enough. We launched Summer Revolution, and uh, again, this is another camp with lots of food and rubbish and mess and sweat and fun times and little sleep. But I was being around to see Wesley come to the first ever Summer Revolution. Uh, many of us know Wesley. He's part of our team that's now launching uh, into the West Side, the West Campus. He's also led hubs here for, for youth. He led, led our Henderson hub at one stage, and he's now raising his family in this church. Uh, but I, I remember the, the summer camp. We and Wesley came along and gave his life to Jesus, and it changed him from that moment forever. He, he, and not only that, that then led to his brothers coming to know Jesus. And that's why we've got J-Bar and AJ around is because of what God did in the life of Wesley. And that's why we do these things. 
That's why we push out. That's why we believe. We're not just looking to fill buildings. We're looking to change many lives. We're looking to change hearts, change people. The music even alone, you've heard the story of Callum's workmate listening to our music and just having a moment where he reconnects back to God. That's why we do what we do. It's all about serving and releasing people to understand what it is God's going to do. And the dream on our church is just to do more of that. (laughs) More changing lives, creating more environments that are going to impact people, empower more people to lead in their environments, release people to keep going, equip people for life through faith in Jesus Christ. That's all we're here to do. And uh, as a church, the theme of our year this year, as Pastor Sam's been talking to us about, is to go big. And we want to go big, but the reason to go big is because we want to go big on serving people. Go big on loving on people. We want to go big, not just to to do what we're doing, but in a better way. We want to stretch out. We want to reach out. We want to create room. But uh, it's interesting when it comes to getting a God dream. You look throughout Scripture, you see many people at different times, God kind of downloads a dream into their heart. He puts a vision in front of them. He gives them a word. He gives them an idea. He gives them a calling. And uh, one of those dreams that is is told and and well-known is when Joseph gets his dream. And uh, for, for those who know the story, they know it well. Jo- we, we understand that Joseph gets a dream. He's the youngest of all of his brothers. That, that he has a dream that, that he would rise above them. He'd come into a place of authority and, and they would bow down to him. Now, as a younger sibling, that dream didn't go down well. But it's the dream that, that God laid on Joseph's heart. He didn't understand the, the reason for the dream, the outworking of the dream, the how of the dream. But he got a dream. And one thing I've come to realize when it comes to getting a dream, the dreams of God don't often come with detail. They generally don't let, you know, like when you order, well, a lot of you are too young to probably even have to deal with this problem, but when you order like a flat pack thing, put a cabinet together, they come with details. The the thing with God is he kind of just gives you pieces of the puzzle and a dream on your heart, and then he goes, hey, let's go on a journey of figuring out how this thing goes together. But for many of us, we want the details. We want to know, but it's the details and knowing that kind of in, in many ways would remove the trust, would remove the reliance on God, would actually, actually do more damage than good. The more you know of what God's up to, it would bring more fear than faith. And, and, and God kind of brings Joseph to this point where he has a dream with no understanding of how to bring it about. And one thing I've also come to realize about God is, is, is the parts of the dream God gives us to get us going are sometimes different to the understanding we get down the road. Like he releases a part of the story that puts us in motion, but then releases the reason for the dream later on. Like you see in in Joseph, to get him going on the dream, he he goes, hey, I'm going to put you in a position of authority. It's a dream he has, that I'm going to put you in a position of authority. But for those who know the story of Joseph's Life is then he becomes a, he gets sold by his brothers to become a slave. He then goes and and works as a servant. And then from servanthood, he he ends up in prison. And then from prison, he ends up as governor. It's this, it's this, it's this weird way that God puts him into this place of authority. But it's the journey he went on that actually brought the understanding and the motive to the dream God had laid in his heart. Initially, he just saw position. By the time he steps into the position or into the dream, he understands the reason for the position. He actually has the reason for why God called him to it. See, a lot of you, especially when you're younger, you get the idea of what what it is, God, you're trying to get me to do. But then as you go on, God starts to realize, no, this is why you need to do that. I have a dream to start a business. That's awesome. But on the journey, God understands, no, this is why you need that business. I have a, I have a dream to write music. No, this is why, God. Because you, you find this moment in Genesis in, in chapter 45, when, when Joseph has gone on this journey of being sold by his brothers as a slave, then from a slave to a servant, from a servant to a prisoner, then from a prisoner to essentially like a governor bringing a th- rule over, over Egypt, and his brothers show up at his doorstep or, or show up in his environment because there's a famine in the land. And the famine ha- has, has now got to a point where people were getting desperate for food. And so 
Joseph's dad, unaware, they were all unaware of now Joseph's position or the fact Joseph was even still alive. He sends the brothers to go get some food. And when they find out, they come to this moment, it's, it's the second, it's the, it's the last quarter of Genesis and great homework for the week team, go and read the story through. So I'm just giving you a quick recap. They come to this moment in Genesis where, where it's made known to them. They come to a realization of the fact that actually this guy is now our brother. They find themselves where, where the dreamers realize there's Joseph and the brothers bowing down to him. The dream is realized. The dream comes about. And they find out that it is actually their brother Joseph. And so they're fearful because they also know, hey, we sold that guy to be a slave. And then what I love is actually Joseph's response in, in Genesis 45, verse 5 to 7. And he says this to his brothers while they're bowing before him, fearful. He says, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been a famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant of the earth and to save your lives by this great deliverance. I love the fact that when Joseph started out on the journey, he had a dream for a position. But as he went on the journey of life, he realized actually that position is just there for service. That dream is just there to be able to serve a nation to help them through a famine. He didn't understand that in the beginning, but the more I've come to realize about the God dreams that he lays on the hearts, and I know I'm speaking to a lot of young people here, that God, God lays dreams on your hearts that get you going in a direction, but on that direction, it's so important you, you discover the reason God's put it in your heart. The reason he's given you that dream isn't so much for yourself or for your influence or for your impact. That, 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 that role, whatever position God gives us is only ever there for the service of people around us to serve others. It was by the time Joseph realized the dream, it was less to do with his brothers bowing and more to do with him serving his brothers. It was less to do with how they treated him, but more now he's in a position where he can help others. Any dream that God gives us isn't just for us. It's a position and a place for us to be able to serve and impact and influence. When God gives us dreams to fill arenas like, like, like Spark Arena for Shout Conference, it's less to do with filling the arena and more to do an environment that can serve people, that can impact lives. When God laid it on our hearts to go into the VCC for the uprising, less to do with filling the VCC and the picture that that was, more to do with serving countless lives to come to know Jesus. Any position or place He's calling us to, you got to understand if it's a God dream, it's a position and a place where you can serve, you can impact. It's less about I, but more about what, less about what I get from it and more about what I can give to it, what I can give to it. The dream of God is often at the end of the day will come to an environment where it's about others. And there's just a couple of quick things to finish off tonight with that I want to say. It's one thing to get started on your God dream. But I, I, there's many things in this category, but there's three I want to talk to about how to sustain the God dream, how to develop the God dream, how to move forward in the God dream. One thing I came to realize is, is when it comes to, to living out a God dream or following a God dream, you gotta be, you got to be okay not being the main character. you got to be okay not being the main character. A lot of people have a dream without the main character in it that it's more about the influence I can build, how God can use me. And it's less about what God's doing and more about the me in it. That a lot of people are building dreams, but the, to sustain a God dream, you got to realize that you got to be okay not being the main one in the picture. Any God dream should first bring glory to God, and then it should be there to lift and serve people. That I'm just a pawn in the picture. I'm just a, a vessel that God can use. And so if the dream on its development becomes more about me, then it's understanding that maybe I've gone away from the intention of the dream. It's amazing how many people start out with the God dream. That then just turns into a dream. 
that then turns into their ambition, which turns into selfish ambition. And, and, I, and I sat on this journey to do something great for God. It's, it's a, but now it's more about just serving what I have in my heart and what I want to achieve with it and what I want to do with it. Well, because it comes points in our journey where you got to be okay with not being the main guy in the picture. That my dream is less about me and more about others. More about others. But a lot of people are working hard to look good. Working hard to impress. Working hard to build reputation. Working hard to prove people what I can do. But a God dream is less about building yourself. It's all about building others and pointing people to Jesus. Because I leave my reputation, I leave myself up to God. I trust God to take care of me. As I'm obedient in Him, I trust that God takes care of me. And I've found the more content I've come, become in my position with God, the less I care about the building of my own life. Because I've understand, no, actually I've got security in God. I've got all I need in God. So I can dedicate my life not to filling those needs because I've found that need in God. It's been filled in God. So I can dedicate my life to the serving of others. The more I realize God, that's why I love it. Even in 1 Samuel, there's this story, and I shared it with some of our uh, Equipus Worship guys a couple of weeks ago, but a story of, of for those who, who aren't familiar with, uh, with Scripture, there's a story of David. You probably would have heard of David and Goliath, David, King David. That's the David we're talking about. It's, it's pre him becoming king, post him killing the giant. And so we got this story of David. David has a good friend called Jonathan. Now, Jonathan is, is the king's son, the current king's son. And, and Don, David and Jonathan are friends, but Jonathan's dad hates David because he's found out that David's going to take his job. And so, the, the, so, so Saul, his name, then decides he wants to kill David. Now, they're, they're in this position where they're trying to feel out, like, is he serious about this or not? You know, like when someone texts you, especially if they're like real good at sarcasm, like Keenan, they'll send you a message and then you sit there for like two minutes. Is, is he serious or not? And so they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to find out, like, is Saul real about this whole killing me thing or not? And so they come up with this plan where Jonathan says, hey, you know what, I'll go to dinner with Dad. He's having this big dinner. And um, I'll kind of feel out the vibes. And if I get the, like, I'm going to kill you vibes, I'll come and let you know. <laughs> and so he sets up the scenario, but they, they come up this way to let David know. They say, Jonathan says, I'll come out after dinner and I'll shoot an arrow into the field. And then I'll tell a servant to go get the arrow. And uh, if, if, if dad wants to kill you, I'll say, hey, go further to my servant. Run quick, go further. And that's a sign, David. He'll be hiding in the bushes that you need to run because dad's pretty angry. The, the other, if I say, no, nah, come close, the arrow's a bit closer, it means, no, nah, David, you're good, come in for a feed. And so they're in this scenario, and Jonathan goes to the dinner and is like, no, nah, dad's for real. He wants to kill this guy. So he takes a servant with him. And he goes into the field and he shoots this arrow. And, and then there's this moment when, in 1 Samuel, verse 20, uh, chap, uh, sorry, 1 Samuel 20, verse 35, where it says, in the, in the morning, Jonathan went out to the field for his meeting with David. We, he had a small boy with him. He said to the boy, run and find the arrow I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot the arrow beyond him. When the boy came to the place where Jonathan's arrow had fallen, Jonathan called out to him, isn't the arrow beyond you? Then he shouted, hurry, go quick, don't stop. The boy picked up the arrow and returned it to his master. Now I love this in verse 39. I love, I love this part of the story. It says, the boy knew nothing about this. Only Jonathan and David knew. Then Jonathan gave him his weapons and said to the boy, go carry them home. I love this story because often, to me, it's in many ways how I've seen God work. Like in the story, you're trying to figure out, are, are we Jonathan or are we David? Or well, in the story, we're, ne we're neither. We're the little boy. We're the little boy. When, when God's using something, Jonathan's using this boy to send a message to David that's going to save his life. And all this boy hears 
is go to the arrow. He goes to the arrow, hurry up. It's like, okay. <laughs> go further. I'm like, but the arrow's right here. Go further. Okay. Okay. Cool. Go home. I imagine walking home being like, hey, why did you get me up so early to shoot an arrow? Yell at me in the field when I was just trying to do my job and then just send me on home. Where was the thanks? Where was the please? No, I walked away. The boy had no idea his life was being used to send a message that was going to save a life. What I've come to realize about God is often He'll use you in ways you have no idea about. God puts something in your heart. Why? Just hurry up. Why? Go further. Okay, now go home. Why, God? You don't know what message your life is sending. My job isn't to know everything God is up to. My job is to be obedient to what God is doing. To be obedient. When it comes to sustaining a God dream, we always try and map out the hows and the where's and the what can I do. The best thing to do to pursue a God dream is remain obedient. Just remain obedient. I love Noah, the story of Noah. Many of us know Noah. We talk about how he built the ark. I love how the Bible talks about how Noah built the ark. How Genesis tells it. God gives this big plan, has this big speaking part in the role. You know, like when you join a school play and you look through and your lines are like, just clap. I'm like, I've got more talent than clapping. <laughs> Teacher's like, yeah, you struggle with the clapping. But, but the this, this story, the, 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 the play of Noah actually goes, God has this big speaking role. Noah, this is what you're going to do. Noah, this is how you're going to build it. Noah, this is what you need to do. And then the end of the, that, that chapter finishes like this. It says, and Noah did everything God asked him to. And then the next speaking part in the role is God gathers the animals and God brings everyone together and God brings the flood. All Noah's part in the whole story that the Bible actually tells us is Noah did everything that God asked him to do. That was 70 to 80 years of Noah's life summed up in one line. Oh yeah, he did what God asked him to do. I love in the story, all the glory is to God. All the honour is to God. When it comes to Noah, yeah, he was faithful. He was obedient. He served God. Yeah, it changed humanity. What was Noah's part? Yeah, he did what God asked him to do. You gotta be okay with not being the main part of your own story. My goal in life is not to finish life and have people tell stories about me. My goal in life, I pray, is that people go, oh, yeah, he did what God asked him to do. And then people can go, oh, yeah, man, these things changed my life. God changed my life. God impacted me. God used me. I don't know if you've ever built an ark. It would be horrible. I don't know if you've ever tried to log in a tree, milling it. I've done that in this era of humanity with tools and power, and it sucks. I reckon about five years of Noah's life would have been spent just shaving bark off trees. But he did everything God asked him to do. Sometimes the dream doesn't always look flash. It doesn't always have the pretty lights, but it'll have a big impact. The other thing is you need, you need others. If you're going to sustain a dream, you need others. God didn't create you to do this alone. So the dream in your heart isn't yours alone. It's not just for you. You can't achieve it on your own. You're going to need community. And you don't just need a crowd. You need a community. You don't just need people. You need people. You need people that are going to champion you, get around you, challenge you, correct, correct you. That's what I love about this community. Ten years. I've been championed and I've been challenged. I've been corrected. I've been stared. I've been aligned. But it's all come to help serve what it is God's called me to do. I couldn't do it alone. You can't do it alone. So many people trying to achieve what God's called them to do in isolation. It's not just you and God against the world. The more I've been in this thing, it's less about what God's called me to and more about what God's called us to. There's an us in it, in the call of God. And the last thing is you've got to be prepared to play the long game. You've got to be prepared to play the long game. To be in this. There's many other things, but for the sake of the night, you've got to be prepared to be in this. I want to say, especially you young people, don't let this just be a season in your life. Let it be your life. Make a decision. I'm not here today and gone tomorrow. 
I'm not just here why it's fun. Come on, I'm in this. I've made a decision. I've given my life to this thing. I grew up with friends that when I was about 16 and I started taking God seriously, they're like, oh yeah, man, you'll be back. <laughs> I've been in friends' houses talking to their parents and I was there one night and friends getting a bit more serious about the church thing. And his mom leans under him and goes, when are you going to get over this phase? And he's still serving the Lord today. This thing isn't a phase in my life. This thing is my life. And so I'm prepared to do what I need to do to navigate that. Because I'm not in it for a moment. Come on, I made a decision in my heart. This is my life. I've given my life to God. I've given my whole life to God. That I run this race of perseverance. I run this race for Jesus. So why don't you jump to your feet tonight? We're going to finish off. Come on, the God dream. The God dream on your heart. Come on, it's not just here today, gone tomorrow. Some people get so discouraged because they're believing for something and it doesn't happen in two weeks' time. <laughs> so no, I'm in this. As long as it takes God, I'm here. Come on, whatever you want me to do, if it's collect arrows, if it's shave bark off a tree. The goal of my life is that I did what God asked me to do. That at the end of my time, God would say, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm here to not make a name for myself. I'm here to serve God and serve people. That's what I'm here for. And just for a moment, while eyes closed and heads bowed, almost done with time, but just feel in this room for some of you, you, you've been around this thing. But for some of you, especially some of you young ones tonight, it's like there's a moment I want to pray even in this. I remember the moment where, you know, I said the salvation prayer about 45 times in my life. And then there was a moment where I said, no, God, I'm in this for life. I'm in this for life. Just even right now, just while eyes are closed, for some of you, you you've been around, but I believe tonight can even be a decision. You're saying, you know what, God, I, I, I give you my life. I'm here, to, I'm here to just let you do with it as you will. I don't want to be here for a moment. God, I make a commitment. I'm not going to get it all right, but God, I'm... I'm in this. One right now, if that just identifies with you, why don't you lift your hands right where you are? Why are you saying, I'm in this? Why I'm in this? Holy Spirit, I just pray right now for one these ones. Lord, you see their hearts. You see their hands lifted. God, I pray even, Lord, as they make this decision tonight to say, I'm in it. God, I'm in it with you. God, I need your help in it. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I need your guidance. I need people. But God, I'm not going to get it all right. But God, my heart is in. God, I'm in it. I'm in it. I commit to you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now, Lord, just release even the courage. Release the dreams. The realization. In Jesus' name. Amen.